started. So my name is Stacy Krim and I work in University Libraries and today we're going to talk about the LGBTQ history of UNCG. Um, I've done this, this presentation many times and when I started back in around 2012 was the first time I did this presentation. I got it. How are you? Um, I could only do 45 minutes speaking at my more, most verbose um, and now I can say I could probably go on for two hours. Um, so I'm going to try to condense everything down as much as I possibly can. You're going to see a few gaps in the historic record and that's pretty common with LGBTQ history because we're talking about a marginalized community that is not going to be well documented historically. We're going to talk about some of the reasons for that as we go through the history. So to begin, um, you may be aware, uh, we just had our 125th anniversary. When we opened in 1892, we were the state normal and industrial school for, uh, for white women, actually. Um, and uh, this was to distinguish us from, of course, Bennett across the road, um, as well as other HBCUs in the area. We were opened as a teacher's college to help restore the level of education in the state after the Civil War. Uh, North Carolina had one of the lowest literacy levels after the Civil War in the South, and it was felt that uh, literacy and education was critical to the economic recovery of the state. So Charles Duncan McKeever, whose statue is out in front of the library, was our first president, and it was his crusade to start a women's college to teach and educate women in a state-funded college to become teachers. Um, of course, this gentleman here is Charles Dun Duncan McKeever with our early faculty. Um, and when we uh, started our first year in 1892, we had 223 students, all women, um, and we had 15 faculty members. And you'll notice that the faculty makeup of our college looked very interesting. We have predominantly women faculty. And this was intentionally done by McKeever for two reasons. One is he felt that women, for women to be put in leadership roles, such as being a teacher, they needed to see other women in leadership roles as being faculty at our college. Um, and this was unusual. You didn't see women in roles like this. It, his other reason was a bit more shrewd. Uh, you could pay women far, far less than you could pay men at this period. Um, so he was getting a really good deal for his money because you could have a woman with the same education as a man um, and then pay her half or less the man's salary. Uh, and the reason this was common was because it was felt that men had to support a family while women were not going to be married and teaching. If they got married, they were probably not going to be keeping a job. They were going to go home and be wives and mothers. Um, and actually our early faculty, if you got married, you had to, to go, um, you could not remain as faculty. So our school was actually very um, gender defying in its early days. Uh, it taught women a lot of uh, subject matters that were not common uh, for women to get in an education beyond the basic homemaking skills. So women here had to learn Latin. Um, I looked at the early transcripts. They didn't do too well at Latin typically, <laughs> but they learned it. They learned geography, they learned history, they learned economics. We also were one of the early pioneers in women's physical education, so we actually had faculty who encouraged women to go out and get some exercise. Um, we had uh, our, for our second doctor, Anna Gove, encouraged women to loosen up or take off their corsets so they weren't bound all the time, and we were known as the school with the thick-waisted women. Um, so, yeah, we, uh, we were gender-defying in a lot of ways from our early years. So our first mention of homosexuality in our curriculum, our first documentation, occurs in 1921 in lecture notes from the Department of Physical Education. Um, and these contents, the contents of these notes are crucial for understanding that homosexuality was being taught in our curriculum, but also for the model that it was teaching, because this is the model that our students, who later as they grew into adults, would understand homosexuality by. Um, the lecture notes presented a plausible, then plausible, developmental model of sexuality. It maintained that from ages one to 10, humans exist in a state of bisexuality, which is described in the notes as a curiosity age, a trying out and seeking and testing of body parts. 
Homosexuality was defined in the notes as autoeroticism or love of self, which occurred between the ages of 10 to 22. So that would be in the age group that our students, early students, would be coming to college here. And note, any same-sex attraction would be based in the love of oneself. It was based um, kind of in the self, not as an independent sexuality. Homosexuality, eventually after homosexuality, you would grow into a state of heterosexuality, so it was evolutionary and developmental. You would start off bisexual, live as homosexual through your teens and early 20s, and then grow into a fully healthy heterosexual adult. <laughs> Homosexuality as an abnormal state occurred when the developmental stage is arrested by sex, same-sex sexual gratification during that stage, not allowing an individual to grow into a healthy heterosexual adult. The notes focus intensively on the concept of the crush among young women, in which a younger, more submissive woman might be attracted to an older, more confident woman. And although it is stated that love between people of the same sex may be very beautiful, which is a very um, liberal perspective for that time, the 1920s, the lecture warns that a woman with the crush could be drawn into a condition of submission or a condition of weak-willedness. And as future educators, the students receiving this lecture were advised to sublimate their infatuation or their students' infatuation with someone of the same sex through involvement with social groups and community organizations. So essentially, if a teacher was to observe homosexual behavior that would arrest a young woman's growth into a healthy heterosexual, they were to redirect the woman's energy and work it out of her. These were physical education majors. They go exercise, go run laps, and it'll be better. <laughs> to reiterate, homosexuality in this model is merely a transition state to heterosexuality, and it is asserted in these lecture notes that no truly homosexual individual, there is no truly homosexual individual in the world. Um, and in any case, the abnormal state of homosexuality should not be encouraged because, to quote the notes, it is immature, non-developing, and non-constructive as no new life can come from it. So the purpose of a sexual relationship has to be based in reproduction. Homosexuality then at this time was viewed as an abnormally arrested state of development and therefore an illness. Homosexuality was designated as a psychological disorder until 1973, sequestering most of the official records on lesbian relationships on our campus among student health records, which are some of the most secure records on our campus. And even before the health record protections of FERPA, student health records were among the most confidential records and were not transferred to our archives as part of our institution's record retention policy. So in other words, the records with the potential to be the richest source of LGBTQ history and at our university are also the most restricted. And here is um, a wonderful quote that I try to quote in every presentation. So in the 1930s, we had this amazing faculty member named Kiel Barkley, who was a professor in the Department of Psychology from 1931 to 1948. And students would seek counseling from him because there was no institution on campus where students could speak about significant life events with any sort of confidentiality. Um, there was no campus psychiatrist or psychologist, um, so there was no one they could talk to. Barclay, being a member of the psychology faculty here, was viewed as the closest they would have to someone they could speak to. And eventually, Kiel Barclay did petition to have a clinical psychologist added to our staff. So he was responsible for having the, fir the first mental health professional added to our staff so that students could speak to him them. A lot of students came to Barclay to talk about various life events, among them lesbian encounters with other students. And I say lesbian encounters because we really don't know how our students would have identified themselves sexually or in terms of gender. That's very hard to understand and get a grasp of um, without the direct input from the people, um, from the people's perspective. And admitting to a lesbian experience on campus was very dangerous. It was known that students were aware homosexuality existed in some definition because we do have those lecture notes, but we have, there, but there was no campus support they could trust to understand the context of their personal experiences. 
Um, and as a psychological disorder, homosexual behavior could be used as a pretext to expel students as suffering from a mental disorder that could not be treated by campus medical staff. Um, Barclay, before he was hired here, was a clinical uh, psychiatrist, so he was the closest we had to a mental health care professional. Word spread to the dean of women, who would be what the dean of, dean of students is now, that Barclay was talking to students and students were seeking counseling from him. And the dean of women approached him and asked exactly what these students were, going, were talking to him about. And he admitted that, among many other things, the students were talking about these lesbian experiences. Well, the Dean of Women was not pleased with this, um, so she cited Barclay to ch the Chancellor at the time, which was Walter Clinton Jackson. Um, and Barclay was called into the Chancellor's office. And the Chancellor tried to get Barclay to stop talking to the women, to stop giving uh, counsel to the students. According to Barclay in his oral history, uh, he said to Jackson, you had three or four thousand women shut up over there in a coop and they were sexual as the Dickens at a time when probably they were burning as highly as they'd ever burned in their lifetimes. And there they were, highly sexual people with no normal sexual outlets. So there grew up a practice on that campus as well as many other places on allowing women a great deal of leeway with respect to homosexual expression with respect to each other. Hug each other, kiss each other, caress each other, and so on innocent as you please. I told them in my estimation that these girls were not extensively homosexual in nature, although I had quite a number of episodes involving such. I said, these girls here are not homosexual, they're simply sexual with no heterosexual opportunity for expression. I believe that if they got the chance for them to have heterosexual expression, in most cases their homosexuality would go poof. So it's interesting to note that Barclay is Barclay's description of our students' sexual development is very much similar to those notes we saw earlier. They're basically, you know, the, the 1930s and 40s versions of lesbians until graduation. They're going to graduate, they're going to find husbands, and they're not going to have to, they're not going to be homosexual anymore. Um, so eventually Barclay um, would be brought bell browbeaten by the chancellor and his department head and um, forced to leave the campus. He ended up founding the psychology lab at UNC Chapel Hill, so that did not hurt his career one bit. Um, so we do know we do have exam we do have evidence of, of homosexuality on our campus in the early years, but we have no uh, per primary source personal accounts from that period. So that was the student climate. You could get expelled, potentially. So what about the faculty climate? We have an interesting story there. This gentleman, his name is Dr. Lee Rigsby, and he was the dean of the School of Music from 1959 to 1965. And in an oral his history with George Dickinson, who is the head of the college orchestra, and this man here, uh, we have an interesting story about faculty climate. In relation to the validity of the oral history, we can call it temperamental, but equally temperamental on the issues specific to the topic. Dickinson claims Rigsby was gay, and I cannot confirm that with any certainty. I do know he was married and had children. That's all I know. Dickinson maintains that Rigsby actively recruited gay faculty members to create what he called an inner circle. That being said, Dickinson felt that Rigsby was very good for the School of Music and possibly the best administrator the school had up to that time. The issue of Rigsby's homosexuality arose specifically in relation to blackmail. Dickinson claims that local band and orchestra directors approached Rigsby and threatened him to out him unless they gained control of the orchestra, saying, you are a homo, I can get rid of you anytime I want to. The orchestra over which they wanted control was the Greensboro Orchestra, which was essentially the women's college orchestra. We were the women's college at this point. Dickinson was the conductor of the women's college orchestra beginning in 1951, and the musicians outside of our campus community apparently felt that they were being excluded and wanted creative control. Dickinson argues that the historical split between the Greensboro Symphony Orchestra and the Women's College Orchestra was achieved, achieved through Rigsby being blackmailed for being gay. Now I will say on a side note, the Greensboro Symphony Orchestra probably at this time would have split just because there were enough qualified musicians in the area by this point that that would not have been a problem. 
But given the implications of Dickinson's story and the lack of supporting evidence, a guarded view is warranted in evaluating the historical value of the information. In terms of assessing the LGBTQ faculty climate at the time, the safest question to ask based on the oral history is whether or not he was gay. Could Rigsby have been blackmailed by an accusation of homosexuality? And in this case, supporting information does exist, and the answer is yes, he could have been blackmailed. So two years before Rigsby arrived at Women's College, Greensboro law enforcement had completed the infamous gay purge of the city. Beginning in 1956 and through the following year, the purge resulted in 60 warrants being served and 32 defendants facing trial. The goal of the purge, in the words of the sheriff, police chief, was to remove these individuals from society who would prey upon youth. Undoubtedly influenced by the hysteria generated by the McCarthy loyalty hearings in the 1950s, and in particular the Lavender Scare, those purge focused exclusively on gay men. Interestingly, while McCarthy effectively stimulated fearful, hostile sentiment against the Lavender Menace, there was still confusion about what exactly homosexuals were. When the information, information about the crimes against nature arrest came across the desk of Women's College alumna Eleanor Dare Kennedy while she was working at the Greensboro Daily News, she had to ask the manager in charge of her shift what a crime against nature was, saying in a later interview, I honestly thought someone had done something to a tree. <laughs> While women's college students would have been safe from the purge, male faculty could be threatened. According to the Greensboro News and Record reporter, uh, in a later article, the witch hunt for gay men only ended when high profile figures in the Greensboro community began to be accused. During her investigation of the history of the Greensboro Purge, she discovered that none of the high society figures had been convicted and that their names exclusively were struck through with capital X's rendering them illegible. So we only have the names of the uh, lower society people. Rigsby arriving in Greensboro in 1959 was entering a community that had just witnessed how effectively a person could ruin a man's life through accusations of homosexuality. By 1957, a police officer, a judge, and two lawyers had been accused. The city may not have been in the frenzy it had been when Rigsby joined the administration of Women's College, but his status would not have made him immune to damage from accusations. So July 1st, 1963, the consolidated system of the University of North Carolina ordered that the Women's College become co-educational, so we officially became the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and you can see just how thrilled our students were <laughs> at that change, and to this day, if you're dealing with a women's college alum, you do not talk about UNCG, you, you call it women's college. Um, when the women's college changed its name, we had to wait a year until 1964 for men to arrive on campus, male students because we didn't have the facilities to actually house male students. We didn't have the bathrooms or the showers or anything separate. Um, and the following year, that year in 1964, 282 full-time undergraduate male students constituting 15% of the undergraduate mm -hmm. student body arrived on this campus. Um, and with their arrival, the landscape for sex and gender issues on our campus changed. So what is the student life like? So according to Ada Fisher, who was class of 1970 and on campus during this time, when asked about the LGBTQ people on our campus, what the population was like, she says, when I was here, most of the women, they were gay in the physical education department. And so they all had that very mannish look with short haircuts, very stereotypical designation of gay women. They called them butch dykes or whatever, and they were in their own world, they didn't care. And she goes on to describe how they were all very respected because the physical education department had really high science and math requirements, so you had to be really smart to do well in our phys physical education department. So we had something of an established lesbian culture and population on our campus. So what about the men, the small body of male students? According to Dr. Fisher, many of the men were gay and still are probably. As a rule, the men were not really outstanding that you remember other than being gay. 
So if you ever wonder where the term UNC gay comes from, it, it, even though we were for many decades a women's college, we didn't become UNC gay really until the men arrived on campus, and then we, we earned this reputation. As one of the UNCG male alumni from the class of 1977 remembered, I can remember telling people, yeah, I go to UNCG, and you heard all the jokes, all the men who go to UNCG are gay, or you know, that sort of thing, so you just ignored it, there was no point in being upset about it. And although there's no means of estimating the number of gay male students on our campus at this time, the rationale behind the perception that many of the men on our campus were gay may derive not from the male students actually being gay, um, but as a challenge to their masculinity. In the UNC system, the women's college was viewed as the female counterpart to North Carolina, UNC Chapel Hill, and NC State. So it was, if a man was attending a woman's college, a former woman's college, he must not be as masculine as a man who would be attending a Chapel Hill or NC State. But in contrast, and not to the exclusion of that perspective, it is possible that, that the newly co-educational UNCG was an attractive option for prospective gay male students, because it's likely that the gay male students would have experienced less bullying on a campus with such a small body of male students versus the male-dominated Chapel Hill and NC State. So it may very well be likely we did attract a lot of gay men early on. So that takes us into the 60s. So let's talk about the faculty climate, late 60s going into the 70s. Here we have two very famous uh, LGBT faculty members. Um, and you have this lovely famous couple, Lenny Gerber and Pearl Barlin, of the famous um, duo in North Carolina. Sadly, uh, Pearl died about a year ago. So Pearl was hired by UNCG in the early 70s to start its doctoral program in the Department of Physical Education. We were boosting up the academics there. Lenny was also a very, very established name in the physical education field. Um, she wrote some definitive works on the study of women's equality in um, university sports and athletics that are still cited today. So they hired Pearl here at UNCG originally, and as you can see, they're, they were very much an out couple. They never hid their, their identity and their relationship. So Pearl moved here first, and um, Lenny was assuming she would get a job at UNCG as well. So eventually she moved here as well. And when she came here, she was told basically to look for a job elsewhere that she was told by other faculty because no one would hire her here because they were afraid of their relationship being too apparent, being too public. Um, it was okay to be a gay faculty member as long as you were extremely discreet, but if you showed, showed off that you were in a relationship, it was much too dangerous for that couple to be working where they might be seen. And it's interesting because David and I did a lot of oral histories. We did an oral history with, um, with Lenny, and I also did an oral history with a gentleman I'll talk about in a minute, Tom, Thomas K. Fitzgerald. And what was uh, an interesting narrative in both cases was we had a lot of faculty members who identified as LGBTQ, but they, if they, these people who were out, very publicly out, were frequently um, they were frequently, other faculty, other gay faculty member were afraid of them, of being seen with them, um, and they were angry with them because their being out threatened the, the faculty members who were still more or less in the closet, their life and their relationships. They were afraid that the repercussions of them being out would have blowback on their own relationships. So it was a very interesting environment at that time. Lenny, although she did not get hired here, she went on to get her law degree at Chapel Hill and was a major civil rights figure and lawyer in our state, a very impressive woman. So once again, she was not held back. Dr. Thomas K. Fitzgerald was a professor in the Department of Anthropology. Uh, he came here in the early 1970s, and he was probably our first out faculty member. 
Um, he also was the first faculty member who taught uh, a class, an entire university sanctioned class on homosexuality. And this was such a well-known class that everyone in the state, all the college students at Chapel Hill, at Duke, would come to take this class. Uh, they had to actually hide the name of the class because it was, they were afraid, students were afraid that if a name of a course that included homosexuality was included on their transcripts, they wouldn't be hired to a job if an employer saw their transcripts. <laughs> and Thomas K. Fitzgerald in his oral history actually remembered, uh, mentioned he had a, a young man who was going to go into the Marines and was very frightened that if the, the course he was in um, appeared on his transcripts, the Marines would not allow him in. So Thomas K. Fitzgerald was a pioneer in our area. He retired um, in the 1990s. So we're very proud at UNCG to have the first faculty member to teach an, a course on LGBTQ issues in the entire UNC curriculum. So continuing, that's the faculty climate in the 70s, continuing to the student climate in the 70s. Um, the things really start picking up in the 1970s. We have civil rights movements, and the LGBTQ movement was, of course, among them. And of course, in 1969, we had the Stonewall riots. But uh, what's interesting is, as the 1960s and 70s continue, we got a larger body of men on campus, and that discrimination that perhaps our gay male students thought they were going to be free of going to a formerly women's college eventually was nullified and neutralized by having more men on campus. This article appeared in our student newspaper, The Carolinian, and it was a full-page article <laughs> comparing the LGBTQ movement on our campus to the women's liberation movement. And it is the first mention of the formation of an LGBT organization on our campus. Although we do not have the oldest official LGBTQ student organization in the UNC system, we do think we have the first unofficial UNC uh, organization in, in North Carolina. So the need for our male student, gay male students to protect themselves created the impetus for this movement of um, creation of the organization on our campus. And the first mention was in this article in 1971. And of course, these students were in the middle of the civil rights upheaval. And the call for, the gay, for a gay liberation movement on campus is mentioned in this art, article, quoting, last year it was decided by some members of the fraternity and a few other males that their image was being threatened by the gay men on campus. It was felt that those gay men were becoming too blatant to be tolerated. They had the audacity to be themselves occasionally. There was some talk among the homosexuals of starting a gay liberation movement here at school. When this uppity talk reached the ears of other men, they decided to act. They all got drunk and said about threatening people with violence. It would be unlikely that the victims of such bullying would be willing to report the threats as homosexuality was not, uh, a per and still is not, a protected class of minority by state law. Additionally, homosexuality was officially still classified as a mental disorder by the American Psychiatric Association at this time, so there was really no pressure for university officials to investigate that situation. It isn't until no November of 1974 that we see evidence of an official organization here on campus. This flyer appeared on the bulletin board in the School of Music, and the flyer was brought to the attention of Jim H. Allen, who was Vice Chancellor of, the student, Affair of student Affairs, and Chancellor James S. Ferguson. In a letter to the office of the UNC System President, Bill Friday, Allen requested for legal advice. Withhold he requested for legal advice. Um, what could be done? Would he be required to withhold institutional support from a student organization? Um, what were the legal ramifications of having an LGBTQ student organization on campus? He was told by a university council that withholding institutional support from a student organization meeting the necessary requirements would be legally precarious. And he, the council provided citations from three federal cases in which the court overruled university prohibitions against gay student organizations. So essentially, a gay student organization with a mission to support its members and to educate the public does not pose a danger to the campus or inherently violate university regulations. 
Also the cases of the federal court overturning the prohibitions of other universities provided the administration of UNCG with legal support in permitting a gay student organization should dissension arise from formal recognition. The first meeting of this organization, which would ultimately be called Gay People's Alternative, was held at the newly opened bar on Battleground Avenue called the Lambda Lounge. Um, and down here, this little thing that looks like a ribbon is a lambda. The lambda was chosen as the symbol of the Gay Activist Alliance in New, in New York in 1970 and declared the symbol for gay and lesbian rights by the International Gay Rights Congress in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1974. So this is just a cool code um, of information for the flyer. Not only is it representative of gay rights, but it's also representing the lambda lounge so you know where to meet. Interestingly enough, as soon as this organization was formed, a, um, a, a uh, movement actually to counter this organization was created um, under the acronym CAUSE. Uh, it was created by a, a fire-breathing minister in the area. CAUSE stood for Christians Actively Undermining Satan's Endeavors. <laughs> So students didn't apply to create an officially sanctioned gay student organization until 1979, and waiting these extra years was to the benefit as it provided time for state and federal courts to pass judgment on the legal status of gay student organizations on other college campuses. The first official meeting of the Gay Student Union was on October 1979. This was an article on the front page of the Carolinian, and they actually got the name wrong. Um, the Gay Academic Union was a separate organization that existed. It was for um, gay academics and gay professionals um, in the area and would eventually become the Triad Business Guild. But the organization for students was the Gay Student Union. So that's no, October 1979. <laughs> So immediately after that front page article appeared in the Carolinian, and the Carolinian at this time was still being sent out to alumni, um, of course we, we got protests from alumna um, about allowing a gay student organization on campus when they read that on the front page. So almost immediately after that organization was announced, the um, we got letters in. Charles, the um, Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, James H. Allen, was the one who usually responded to those letters. And it was interesting, we have several of these letters in university archives, and some are a bit more coherent than others. Um, and But there were two prominent themes among the letters. The first is that homosexuality is a perversion leading to collapse of civilization, so um, that hasn't happened yet. Um, the second argument, which was even more fascinating from our perspective, is that by joining the Gay Student Union, young people would be stunting their maturity, and if the students isolated themselves, they would never be able to adapt to living in heterosexual society. So you had these alumna uh, who were here in the 20s, which most of these letters were from alumna who were here in the 20s, using that developmental model. That's what they knew of homosexuality, and they felt that if students were a part of this organization, it would stunt their sexual development, and they would not grow into healthy heterosexual adults. Um, there was also the perspective that of course, this was a phase, and that what would happen for a student if they joined one of these organizations, their name appeared in the paper or a picture was taken, and then later they were never able to find a husband because they would be forever associated with a gay student organization. So there were all sorts of concerns about this. Administration would send replies, and in these replies, they would cite those federal court cases basically indicating the UNCG has no legal right to disallow um, a gay student organization, so the organization was going to stand. So, let's see, October 1979. Within one month, we have our first major protest on campus, so that didn't take long. Um, the first, uh, first major anti-gay protest on our campus happened in Strong Dormitory. A gra graduate student by the name of Richard Stiley, who was a uh, counselor in Strong Dormitory, organized an educational seminar on homosexuality 
um, which was organized because of growing tension between gay and straight students in the dorm. The seminar featured Reverend Joseph Flohr, who is pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Greensboro and faculty sponsor for the Gay Student Union. Um, and I should mention, it was interesting, he was the first faculty sponsor for the Gay Student Union as a Presbyterian minister because a faculty, regular faculty member, could have had pushback from administration if they were the ones supporting the Gay Student Union, but there was really nothing university administration could do to a Presbyterian minister because you know they answer to a higher authority, um, basically. What are you gonna tell them to do, go back to their church? The other faculty member was, of course, Thomas K. Fitzgerald in the Department of Anthropology. So, Around 10 p.m. at night, a group of anti-gay demonstrators wearing masks and setting off firecrackers met on Gray Drive, gathering additional protesters as they reached Strong Dormitory. Assembling in the courtyard, around 100 protesters yelled things like, fags go home and dames not flags. Campus security met with the protesters, telling them that they were permitted to hold a peaceful protest until 11.30 p.m. and ordered them to stop, stop setting off firecrackers and to uh, take off their masks. The protesters obeyed and continued the demonstration. Reverend Joseph Flora left the seminar to engage the protesters, explaining the purpose of the seminar and calming the crowd. Flora was questioned about his support of the seminar given the perceived biblical interpretations against homosexuality which he addressed. The protest ended without violence, though there was report that property damage against LGBTQ students increased in the dorm after the event. So if this happened today, we would be all over national news, but at this time, campus security just showed up and said, eh, and let it happen for a little while, and then it dispersed. So going on to the 80s, according to accounts, UNCG during the 80s contained a noticeable LGBTQ population on campus, and that population was visible to heterosexual, the heterosexual student body. For many of the students at UNCG, this was the first environment in which they were aware of encountering a person from the LGBTQ community, and like all first encounters, they could be uncomfortable. According to some of the alumna from the classes of the 1980s, they said, they just acted like they were regular people. Then the people of my class that I hung out with of my age, we all were taken aback by them and we preferred not to be around them, especially in large numbers. You know, and there were gay bars at the edge of campus and I would never have chosen to go there. I didn't actually go there, but there were some people who would go to it just as soon as any other place. And I wouldn't, I'd rather go to a heterosexual place. Another student who was uh, here in the fall of 1983 recalls, homosexuality was very big, particularly because there were just enough students who we titled them flamers because they were very, men had pocketbooks, you know, women that you know, they had that very masculine look to them and they were very visible, so you knew it was on campus. I took classes with several of them. I was hit on by one girl and it was very uncomfortable. So needless to say, if the anxiety heterosexual students displayed against LGBTQ students added, their anxiety added to the burden of discrimination against queer students on our campus, the discrimination they already faced. In an anonymous interview with one lesbian UNCG student, she says, I feel that people being afraid of me makes them forget that I still like them to say hello to me when they see me in the hall. I still like to be treated as a human being. The student was a member of the LGBTQ student organization at that time and said that there were usually around 15, 10 to 15 at most uh, students at the meeting. The organization was important to her because she felt the, those heterosexual students who knew about her sexual identity ignored or avoided her. On top of being unable to develop friendships important to developing a healthy life as a college student, the student interviewed also had difficulties with her parents who refused to acknowledge her sexual identity. This student was not alone in her distress. Dr. John D'Amelio, a UNCG faculty member in the Department of History at this time, confirmed, because I am openly gay, many gay and lesbian students at UNCG come to me for advice. They come to my office with fear in their eyes and fear in their voices. They know that prejudice and discrimination exist. 
This lack of support both on campus and at home combined with homophobia meant that the LGBTQ plus students faced greater pressure than most heterosexual students, sometimes with fatal consequences. Kenneth Crump was a 21-year-old freshman at the time of his death. He lived in Strong Dormitory. There's no photograph of Kenneth in the school yearbook or the Carolinian, but he was described as being a small young man weighing roughly 120 to 140 pounds. He was a dance major, and according to his ballet instruction, instructor, he was an excellent and natural dancer. Kenneth's roommate described him as a lover of opera, ballet, and French horn, which he played. But few people on campus knew Kenneth personally, but he was known to have a circle of friends off campus. At 1 a.m. on November 22, 1982, Kenneth shattered the glass from a window on the ninth floor of Jackson Library Tower and jumped to his death. In the letters to the editor section issue of the Carolinian following his death, they mentioned Kenneth. Lisa Y. Williams, a UNCG student and friend of Kenneth, asserted that the reason for Kenneth's despondency and consequent suicide was that he was being bullied by residents at Strong Dormitory for being gay. She stated he lived in Strong Dorm and some of those guys who stayed there were glad that Kenneth was dead. Kenneth's sexual preference was different from theirs, so they were delighted that he had jumped from the library. Presumably in protest of Williams' perspective, as it doesn't specifically mention Kenneth or his suicide, the letter immediately following was signed by a list of male residents from Strong Dormitory and maintained, we do not live in Hell Dorm, we haven't lived there for years, we appreciate publicity as well as good fiction, we do not care for lies, liars, exaggeration, innuendos, or muckraking journalism, this is the word of 100 good men. Tragically, little memory remains of Kenneth on this campus, aside from the whispers you have probably heard that someone may have committed suicide by jumping off the library tower and those plexiglass windows with the wooden railings. So continuing in the 1980s, the 80s were just kind of sad. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and admit that. Of course, we have the AIDS epidemic. We have the first mention of AIDS on our campus occurring in the Carolinian in 1983, which is really, really early, but it didn't really hit the UNC system until 1985 with a direct UNC response. Um, by 1985, the UNC system implemented a task force to address AIDS on campus. Um, the number of students on the UNCG campus who are infected with the disease is unknown, but a 1986 article mentions there was a case of AIDS detected on campus, and that student had since left. Whether the student was asked to leave or left voluntarily was not specified, but it should be noted that to protect the university in the event of potential legal liability, it was advised that if a student living on campus housing contracted AIDS, their roommate was to be informed, preferably by that individual. Institutionally, the UNC system administration addressed the AIDS epidemic across campus by creating and disseminating information about the disease. It was their goal to create a series of information packets and to disseminate this information to avoid the stereotype of AIDS being a gay disease. They were wanted to do away with the rumors and innuendos. Student health services at UNCG developed a preliminary policy for dealing with AIDS patients. This included procedures such as advise the patient of possible social problems, particularly in residence halls, if it is known or rumored that he or she has AIDS, suggest that if he or she elects to remain in school, it might be in their best interest to consider residing off campus due to social consequences. And the policy also clearly stated that AIDS victims, as they were to be described, would not be barred from classes, from using university facilities, or from public gatherings. There's no mention of homosexuality in that particular policy. And I will go ahead and admit, uh, to mention that in Greensboro especially, we had the Triad Health Project, which was co-founded by Johnny McGee and Bruce TD, and we did an oral history with them, which will be online soon. And um, AIDS didn't hit, there were, even, even at its peak, only a few hundred in the county but we had excellent support in the Greensboro and Triad area because of the early initiatives with the Triad Health Project teamed up with Cone Health. So we were able to address this before it got seriously out of hand. 
Overall, UNCG's response to AIDS in terms of providing information to educate students and staff was respectable, but there was there is no information on how the epidemic unfolded on a personal level. There's no measurable form of assessment to judge the effectiveness of the campus education's educational resources. And of course, we have no accounts from that period because anyone who contracted AIDS at this point would have likely died. Okay, so let's get to the 90s. By the 1990s, we saw a discernible change in the climate for both faculty and students. It's like literally we hit the 90s and a switch had been flipped in terms of um, LGBT climate in Greensboro. And um, there are several reasons for this, but that's probably also related to the climate change on the national level. In 1992, that was the year the World Health Organization declassified homosexuality as a mental illness. Um, and it was the coming out year for UNCG students as well. Keith Hill was interviewed in the Carolinian. He was the first totally out student um, on our campus, which means he's the first student who is interviewed about being gay and openly is assigned, attaching his name to the identity. Um, there was a, this was a huge moment because it was the first time a student felt safe enough to be openly named and interviewed. Um, and only in the past we had anonymous interviews. Additionally, LGBTQ plus alumni from UNCG began to be named in the Greensboro News and Record in association with various social works that were implemented in the area. Keith Hill, who identified himself as a black gay male, um, was a member of the Gay and Lesbian Student Association here at UNCG. <coughs> The interview titled Dialogue with a Homosexual appeared in two pages in the Carolinian, and Hill's candid responses provide insight into the lives of LGBTQ students on our campus, as well as the intersection of race and sexual sexuality. Um, when asked about uh, the climate on the campus, he says that surprisingly his male heterosexual friends seemed very supportive. The biggest issue he had was dealing with his gay identity in the African American community. So of course we haven't addressed in, in this narrative so far the, uh, the issue of white privilege in gay history that um, the ability to be out and open is not going to be the same across all identities. His family was having a really hard time dealing with his identity. But Hill was extremely optimistic. This being 1992, he envisioned a time he would find a young man, fall deeply in love, and they would get married and adopt kids, which in 1992, the idea of gay marriage, of course, was something we never thought we would ever see. An interesting um, point he brings out in this interview is the difficulty of finding positive role models for the LGBT community. He said growing up, he had a very difficult time in media and in books, finding positive role models that reflected uh, gay men or black gay men in a positive life. They were usually projected as being unnatural, lustful, or comedic. So he had a really difficult time growing up and finding his own security in his own identity. So as our students were coming out, so were more of our faculty, and our faculty were also including LGBT topics in our curriculum, which was increasingly important. Um, this is John D'Amelio, who I mentioned earlier. He came here to teach uh, history, uh, and he went on, uh, he just retired from the University of Chicago and was one of the most predominant gender historians the United States has produced recently. <laughs> um, and we had the opportunity to interview him and discuss one of his curriculum exercises he did with his class. The assignment for the gay segment was to write a coming out letter to your parents. And, you know, I thought, okay, this would be a good way of getting them to think about the issue and, like, if they were gay or lesbian, how, what would they say if they were telling their parents? Well, it became the talk of the dormitory, apparently. And the week before it was due, when we had started the segment on gay and lesbian politics, uh, in the middle of the class, a student asked, uh, raised her hand, and said, I have a question about the assignment. And the question she asked was, 
do we have to mail our letters? And she was totally serious. And I thought, you know, I, before I could answer anything, other hands started going up and people, you know, one student said, well, what if our roommates see the letters? And somebody else said, my roommate did see the letter. And it just went on like this. And I'm just standing there letting it happen. Uh, and then finally, one of the students in the class said, oh my god, I understand what the assignment is about. This is what people who are gay must actually worry about and fear. It's like, what is it like to come out? So it was you know, one of these dramatic examples of like raising consciousness in the context of teaching a course. Uh, I wish I could have done it you know, every year, but once the story was out, it would have never been quite as effective as it was the first time. Yeah. An assignment for the... So I mentioned students are coming out, faculty are still having some issues, um, and still probably do. Uh, we tend to be very uh, affirming of our students, but not quite as affirming of their faculty. That takes longer to, to, to happen. So in, it wasn't until 1996 that we started get, seeing, we got a statement of non-discrimination in our faculty staff nob, uh, manual. And this was because three lesbian students on campus made a push that a statement of non-discrimination needed to be both in the student handbook as well as the faculty staff manual. Um, interesting, by this time, 10 of the 16 UNC schools had some sort of statement of non-discrimination in their manuals. So this battle, which continued over several months um, and was quite a bit of a scandal, received um, statewide attention because people were looking at UNCG and like, you guys are UNC gay, how can this be such a problem for you? Eventually, we did get, of course, the non-legally binding statement in our manual, which does uh, remain until the, today. Um, so uh, now we do have a statement of non-discrimination for sexual identity and gender in our manual. I'm going to go a little bit faster now because I'm running out of time. So 2000, 2000 was an important time because this is the time Safe Zone was developed. Um, and we started finally offering training to our faculty and staff, and we had had no really formal institutionalized training before, <laughs> uh, sadly. So Safe Zone originally was funded through grants from the Greensboro, the Guilford Green Foundation, because we were afraid to fund it internally because we were afraid of what taxpayers and donors would say if they knew we were funding such a program. Ethan Hutchinson is a trans student who actually was one of the students who helped develop the Safe Zone program here. And I have a clip <coughs> of, from his oral history, which is an audio oral history, talking about his time. He was here as an undergrad, as a lesbian student, came back as a grad student, and transitioned during that time. So this is the first account we have of a trans student talking about their experience. Folks didn't know a lot about anything that had anything to do with trans identities at the time. So to see someone that was so extremely um, masculine, even though identified as a woman, a lot of administrators, people who employed me on campus, didn't get it, didn't understand. But they had such a good enough relationship with me that they felt like they could ask. And so, you know, there's a little bit of homophobia and transphobia embedded in that, but it was good nature, right, and good meaning. and for the purposes of understanding. I do remember one particular administrator, I had this conversation about she, you know, she was sort of like, if you're a woman, how come you don't dress more like a woman, you know? And I was sort of like, well, you know, these clothes are what presentation-wise make me feel comfortable when the world interacts back with me. Because I was telling her a story I think about where somebody called me sir, and she was like, well, that's an easy fix. And I said, no, it's not an easy fix for me. It's obviously not an easy fix for the rest of the world either. And so we were having a little debate about that. And then incidentally, I also worked for her when I was a graduate student and was actually transitioning. And she had been one of the people that had um, interviewed me for homecoming court. And, um, and uh, so she remembered distinctly all this, all, how, how um, direct and, and firm I was about how, you can, how proud I was to be a woman who was masculine, right? And she said, so now what are you doing? 
<laughs> you know, I thought the point was to be a woman who's masculine, right? And so, and so people just not understanding the trajectory, right? Um, you know, a lot of what happened during those days is if you were the student who was lesbian or gay or bisexual, you were the expert, right? The institution at that point had not yet put its resources into institutionalizing um, support for these students. And so um, there was no dedicated staff person on campus, right? For example, it was a long time before we got one of those, and it was part-time at best. I wasn't even here anymore by the time we got one of those. Um, and so, I, so that's di discrimination at a structural level, right? Not at, not at a direct you and me as two human beings level, but structurally, UNCG had not decided to institutionalize support for this group of beings, which means that the students had to do the work. And that was true when I was here as an undergrad, and that was true when I was here as a graduate student. As a graduate student, I was the one running around and, and doing educational workshops and lectures about what it meant to be a trans person. And, and that's difficult to do, particularly when you're at the beginning of your transition, uh, because you don't even know everything about what it means to be a trans person. So people ask questions, you're like, oh, you know, um, and have that experience, don't have any idea. Uh, so um, I can I went through Safe Zone in 2008, and I can definitely say I learned an incredible amount from students such as Ethan, who were um, kind enough to <laughs> to share their stories with us. Um, but finally, UNCG was getting some faculty staff education support, and that was through the uh, that was through the Wellness Center. Um, Safe Zone was run through there. <laughs> So continuing 2000s, we have a very out population, which means we're going to have a little bit of a development of um, counter movements against it. And there's going to be more incidents of intersectionality and the conflict that arises from that. And of course, uh, what a better place for a conflict than a book display at Jackson Library. So uh, Pride decided to do a Black History Month book display featuring African-American gay authors. Uh, and Pride came under attack for that. There were over 20 phone calls to library administration the first day that exhibit went up. Um, there was actually a huge scandal on campus. The uh, newly formed college Republican group took exception to the protest and to the, to the uh, book display and demanded that funding be pulled from Pride. Um, so this was kind of the first, this was the intersexuality not only of sexuality, gender, and race, but also we have this beginning of political uh, upheaval on our campus in 2002, which would continue to 2004 with Pride Week versus Morality Week, where um, the College Republicans organization decided um, they did not care for Pride Week one bit, and we're going to have a counter, um, counter week of celebration, which they called Morality Week. Uh, this was uh, followed very, very closely because there was assumption that there was potential for violent protest. And there was some protest, but it was never violent on the cam this campus. So both organizations, Pride and the College Republicans, had their own week, which went fairly smoothly for both. And actually, organizers of both Pride Week and um, Morality Week came to the conclusion, perhaps we need to start a dialogue and go to attend each other's events and start talking to each other. Um, I don't know how, I don't have any historic record of how far that went, but at least our students acknowledged the need for communication and breaking down those barriers. So, to wrap us up a bit, so I don't start continuing presenting up into the present point, um, where are we now and where are we going? According to the, uh, the um, actually it's the 2018, I've got that date wrong, 2018 um, National College Health Survey for our campus, 30.8% of our students identified as non-heterosexual, non-gender binary. So that's the statistic we have. It's not the best statistical tool, and one thing we can do to improve is actually have a better statistical mechanism for getting information, but without a doubt, we have a very massive population of non-heterosexual, non-gender binary students on campus. We now have a full-time employee to Elliot, <laughs> perfect timing, who, who actually in his title is deals with LGBTQ students. We've had a huge amount of staff and faculty who have given support and offer training in the past, but we haven't had that key personnel person um, who actually had that in their job title. 
And now, of course, Safe Zone is offered through the Office of Intercultural Engagement. We do have a space for LGBTQ students in the EUC, and we do have LEARN, the LGBTQI Education and Research Network. So um, I will say this is like, this was the front page of UNCG in 2011. It was the first time anything LGBTQ made it to our front page. So that was, I took a screenshot of that. That was a very important moment in our university's history. So we're improving, as you can tell. So what do we need? Um, these are kind of just overviews of, of input I've got. Definitely the formation of an LGBT community center on campus, improvement services and visibility for trans students, as well as visibility uh, of queer people of color on the campus. Um, uh, I believe it's probably been mentioned many times here that we're, the LGBT community is not a monolithic community. We need to recognize that and we do need better statistics. So if you're interested in learning more about university history or LGBT history in the area, of course, it was mentioned, we do have the Pride of the Community Project, which has uh, digital collections as well as several oral histories, including Mr. Uh, Kimball's oral history, which you can uh, listen to and watch there. Uh, if you like university history, we also have a blog that features an article about university history every Monday and includes many uh, LGBT histories relating to our university. So thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions? All righty. Well, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.